So this morning we're continuing to work through the Gospel of Luke. And we've been working through Luke on our Sunday mornings for the last couple of weeks. And last week Keith covered Luke chapter 2. And he really focused on a concept that is extremely difficult for most of us. Change. Something that a lot of people don't like or don't really want to deal with. But what he talked about was going to God in change. Right? Trying to turn to him and making sure that we were focused on him despite the challenges, despite the surprises, despite the circumstances that life sometimes dishes out to us, continuing to go back and fix our eyes on Jesus. And so let me ask you, how have you handled change this week? Have you had to deal with change this week? And how did you handle it? Have you turned to God? Have you continued to fix your eyes on Jesus, even if things were hard? Because this is, this is something that we're constantly going to face, constantly going to, to deal with as we live our lives. And especially as we're trying to live for Jesus, it's, there's, a, there's constantly going to be these distractions that Keith talked about. And so we need to continue to come back to Jesus, focused on God. And in his lesson last week, Keith was primarily focusing, or what I took from it anyways, he's primarily focusing on kind of the dealing with the change that comes at us, right? The, the things that life deals to us that we can't necessarily control or we can't necessarily decide on how it's going to come, but we still need to make a decision on how to respond. And so that was a, it was a lot of that external change that we were facing. That was what Keith was talking about last week. But this week, we're going to continue to talk about change, yes. but we're going to talk about change that we can control. Because some of, the, some of the circumstances of life, of course, we can't control. We can't really do anything about. We just have to make a decision how to deal with it. But there is a lot of change that we can control. And that's change that starts with us. Change that starts inside of us. The changes that we need to make in our lives and our hearts to do our very best for God. And so we're going to talk about that this morning because we're going to start in Luke chapter 3. And as Luke chapter 3 opens, the focus is back on John the Baptist and on his ministry. And if you remember John the Baptist and what he came to do, he came to prepare people's hearts for the Lord. To prepare people to connect with Jesus. To prepare people to live for him. And so he has a lot of thoughts about what it looks like to be prepared in our hearts to do that. And so for them, back at this time when John was preaching... There was work to be done in order to be prepared for Jesus. And the same is true for us today. If we want to be prepared for Jesus, we want to be able to be connected with us, connected with him, there is work to be done. So that's what we're going to talk about this morning. So let's dive in. Luke chapter 3, starting in verse 1. It says, In the 15th year of the the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod, tetrarch of Galilee, his brother Philip, tetrarch of Arturia and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, tetrarch of, tetrarch of Abilene, Luke being the historian here, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into all the country around the Jordan, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. As is written in the book of the words Isaiah the prophet, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. Every valley shall be filled in, and every mountain and hill made low. The crooked road shall become straight, the rough way smooth, and all the people will see God's salvation. John said to the crowds coming out to be baptized by him, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath. Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not say to yourselves, We have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that out of these stones God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. What should we do then? The crowd asked. John answered, Anyone who has two shirts should share with the one who has none. And anyone who has food should do the same. Even the tax collectors came to be baptized. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you're required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, well, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. And so, in order to prepare people's hearts for Jesus, what was John 
preaching. He was preaching all about repentance. To get back, to turn back to Jesus. That was what that John, that's what John continued to, to teach about and what his ministry was all about. It was about repentance. That's what he preached. That's what he baptized people for. It was all about turning people's hearts back to God. It was all about repentance. And so if John's ministry was all about repentance to try to prepare people's hearts for God, for Christ, then what do you think we need today if we're going to prepare our hearts for Christ, for Jesus in our lives? Repentance. It's not that much different, right? All of us need repentance. And it doesn't matter what your story or background is. It doesn't matter if you were, you were raised in a Christian household or not. It doesn't matter whether you think that you're a good person or not. We all need repentance. Unless, for some reason, you are completely sinless, in which case you're Jesus and I need to talk to you um, because I want to learn a lot from you. Or, alternatively, maybe you have been a sinner at some point in time, but then you have just been so self-disciplined that you've just stopped sinning altogether and you no longer need to repent. And also, if that's the case, I would love to learn many, many things from you. But I'm guessing that none of us are in that boat. I'm guessing that we all still struggle with sin and we all still need to come back to repentance. And while most of us are familiar with that term, we've heard this idea of repentance It's still this very misunderstood concept. And it's unfortunate because it gets a lot of these misconceptions kind of thrown throughout our lives and throughout the teaching about what repentance is. Because here's the thing. Repentance is not changing what you do. Repentance is not modifying your behavior. That's a very common misconception. We often think, we say, oh, okay, you're supposed to repent. That means I just need to change what I'm supposed to do. No, changing your behavior and the actions that result, those are the fruits of repentance. John talks about that. He says to produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And then he goes on to share a lot of different examples of what that looks like for different people. When the tax collectors come to him and ask about what it's supposed to mean, he gives them some very specific fruits to do, fruits that they can practice, right? Same thing with the soldiers, or he's talking about giving, giving the clothing or giving the food. Those are fruits of repentance, but they're not repentance in and of itself. Repentance happens here. It's a change of heart. It's a change of mind. So it's something that happens entirely in the heart and mind. It's a fundamental paradigm shift about how we view our sin and how we view our relationship with God. It's not pleasing people. It's not just saying, oh, okay, I'm going to change this because someone said that I need to change this. It's not just looking the part. It's a true and real fundamental change that comes from being convicted by God to be different. That's repentance. When we have that heart change, when we have that mind change that says, I need to do something different. I need to be better for God. And maybe it's very specific. It hits you in a certain area of your life, but your heart changes and says, this needs to be something different. It needs to be different better. That is repentance. And repentance in and of itself is not something that you can necessarily see right away because it happens inside. But as John talks about, true repentance always bears fruit, always bears good fruit. So you can have action change. You can have behavior modification without repentance and you can fool the world, but you can't feel fool God. But When we have true heart level and mind level repentance, it will always produce that fruit. It will always be there. And so a good question for all of us to ask ourselves, when's the last time that you have truly repented? When's the last time that your heart was truly challenged, truly convicted, and you worked with God to change that heart? And where's the fruit? Where's the fruit of that repentance? Because, again, it can't just be this outward thing. And really, the longest, the the longer and longer we're around, the longer and longer we're 
practicing our Christianity or the more and more familiar, familiar we are with the teachings of Christ, the, the more, and more, difficult it, it's more and more difficult it is to actually repent. Because we know what it's supposed to look like. We know what we can do to make it look right. We know what we can do to, to act the part, to, to go through the motions, right? But as far as actually changing our heart at a fundamental level, that becomes more and more challenging, isn't it? And so it's much easier to just focus on the surface, to just focus on changing what we do or how we look, as opposed to truly repenting in our hearts. And I was thinking about this, and a few weeks ago, I was clearing out the, the trash wood in my yard. And prior to actually removing it from my yard, I had just, I, I wanted to clean it up because. So for those of you that don't know, I, I had knocked down this horrible guardrail on my deck um, a while ago, so earlier this summer. And it was just like laying strewn all about my yard. It was a terrible disaster, and it just looked horrible, but I just didn't want to really do anything about it for a while. But then the appraiser was going to come. And I was like, ooh, you know what? I might, I might benefit a little bit from kind of cleaning up the giant piles of trash and that's strewn all over my yard. So I'm, I'm going I'm to clean it up a little bit. So I spent about an hour and a half, and I took all this wood, and I was just trying to stack it neatly. Right? This is all rotted, gross, trashy wood from my deck, and I'm just trying to stack it neatly in my yard. Take note that I wasn't actually getting rid of it. I was just reorganizing it. So I, so I was trying to make it look a little bit better for the appraiser. And actually, in fact, as I was doing that, I was taking some wood and bringing it further into my yard to be part of the stack, as opposed to getting closer to the exit as I was trying to clean it, right? And I put all this work in, and I was sweating, and I went back on top of my deck, and I looked at what I've done, and what did I see? A giant pile of trash wood. That's what it was. It was, it was a little bit more organized, a pile of trash wood, but it was still a big pile of trash wood. And isn't this so easy for us to do in our lives and in our relationship with God and with our sin? Right? Instead of actually removing it, instead of actually taking it out of the yard, we just try to dress it up. Yeah. Right? We just try to make it look a little bit prettier. We just try to make it organized, a little bit more clean, so that when the appraiser comes, whoever the appraiser might be in your life, that it, can just, it just looks a little bit better. But the reality is it's still trash. And ultimately what the solution is, it needs to get out. Right? And so luckily I did, I asked for help, which is something that we all need when we're trying to clear out the trash in our hearts. I asked for a little bit of help and a bunch of people came and got the, the, the trash out of, my, out of my yard. And now it looks much better. But again, this is something that we have to constantly be asking ourselves when we're thinking about our relationship with God. Are we clearing out the trash or are we just moving it around? Are we really repenting or are we just changing the actions to try to make it look better, look better? cleaner. It's so important for us to continue to cultivate this repentant heart. And it's not just a one-time thing. It's an all-the-time thing. It's something that we have to continue to go back to. It's something that we have to remember and something especially that we have to remember and come back to because guess what? There's another side of this coin. There's another side of the battle that does not want you to repent. That's right. There's another side that wants you to be convinced that true repentance is not necessary at all. And that's actually what we're going to read about next. Because as we continue in Luke, Jesus himself actually gets baptized. And not that he needed to repent of anything, but he sets a wonderful example for us. And many point to that moment as the beginning of Jesus' public ministry. The sky opens, the, the voice comes from heaven that says, this is my son with whom I am well pleased. And it's this pretty epic and momentous moment, even for Jesus in his life. It's this pretty incredible stuff. And right after this, though, something really interesting happens. Right after what we might consider a very big or very high spiritual high for Jesus, Jesus comes face to face with the enemy who wants to take it all away. And actually, we're going to be in Luke chapter 4 now, starting in verse 1. We'll read what happens here. It says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, left the Jordan, was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, where for 40 days he was tempted by the devil. He ate nothing during those days, and at the end of them, he was hungry. The devil said to him, If you are the Son of God, tell the stone to become bread. Jesus answered, It is written, Men shall not live on bread alone. 
The devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me. And I can give to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will all be yours. Jesus answered, It is written, Worship the Lord your God and serve him only. The devil led him to Jerusalem and had him stand at the highest point of the temple. If you are the Son of God, he said, Throw yourself down from here, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against the stone. Jesus answered, It is said, Do not put the Lord your God to the test. When the devil had finished all this tempting, he left him until an opportune time. And so immediately after Jesus' baptism, he goes into the wilderness and he is tested by Satan. What's Satan's goal? To try to get him to lose his trust in God. To try to convince the human part of Jesus that he didn't want to rely on God, that he didn't want to follow his plans, and that instead he, would, he needed to or wanted to worship him, Satan. right? To get Jesus to cave to him. And here's the thing, guys. If Satan had the audacity... To go after Jesus, the perfect human being who is God, you'd better believe that he's going to come after you. You'd better believe that he's cocky enough to think that he can get you. If he thought he could get Jesus, he thinks he can get you. And so we have to constantly be aware of that and be ready and thinking about that. We're a much easier target than Jesus. So he's coming. And look what, what, look, look what, Jesus, or what Satan tempts Jesus to with here. It's it's not just stuff that Jesus might want, and I'm sure some of the things were things that Jesus wanted, but it's stuff that Jesus could easily have thought he deserved. It's stuff that, yeah, of course I deserve this. You could easily imagine Jesus thinking that, right? He had been fasting for 40 days. You think that he thought he might have deserved some bread? Yeah, totally. And he, he had the power to do it, so why not? Right? So Jesus said, oh, well, Jesus could have easily been like, well, yeah, I've been really working hard for God, and I've really been fasting and praying and thinking about a relationship with him, and so, yeah, I'm totally able, and I deserve to be able to turn this bread, this stone into bread. Or you think about the power, right? Jesus was, is God, so really he already has the power, and so, yeah, why not? Just, just get it. I deserve it anyway. I'm God, so yeah, I, I do want all the power over. I want dominion over all, all of the kingdom." All of these people, right? Or even as it relates to the the safety, right? That, okay, Jesus had a plan. Jesus had a purpose to go out and save the world. You think that that would afford him a little bit of extra security, right? That he could jump off a tower and be okay because there was a bigger purpose in mind for him. So obviously God is going to protect him. And so all of these things are things that Jesus could have easily deserved. That Satan was tempting him with. Jesus, or Satan is going to continue to take whatever he can and try to get us to cave to him. But man, I think one of the easiest ways for him to do that is to convince us that we deserve whatever sin that we want to get ourselves into. Because we've worked so hard in that area. Don't we just deserve a little bit of a break? right? Or maybe we've been working so hard in other areas. We've been really focused. And so, oh, we, can just, we, can, we don't have to focus as much in this area. So we can just let it slide because we've had some success and some victory in all of these different places. And so, oh, well, we don't have to focus too much here. He knows, Satan knows that it's a tougher sell to just get us to go against things that we know are, are wrong. Yeah. He knows that that's a hard road to go. But man, if he can get you to justify it, if he can get you to just think that, oh, it's okay, you deserve it or you... It's okay for you because of the work that you've been putting in. Yeah, that's that's something that he can get us with. He can convince you that it's right. Yeah. And you know what? Even if you do resist, what's he going to do? Push. He's going to push. But then if you resist, he's going to go. But then he's going to come back when? At an opportune time. Hungry. What's an opportune time? All kinds of opportune times. Transition. Life is busy. Things are difficult. Circumstances are hard. The relationships you have or you're struggling with, right? You're feeling weak. And it'll attack in the most important areas of your life. Your spouse, your kids, your job, your future, your concern for the future. You're being stuck in the past of what you've experienced before. 
He's going to hit you wherever he can. Whatever it is that's most distracting to you, he's going to exploit it. He's going to try to exploit that to get you to fall and cave to him. He's going to provide open doors that look like they're from God himself and try to coax you to run through them. First Peter chapter 5, verse 8 says, Be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. He's waiting. He's prowling. He's looking for, for the, the, the chunks in your armor that he can get under. He's very real. In what ways is Satan tempting you now? What is he trying to get at? What is he trying to convince you that you deserve? And where is he attacking you? In your relationships? In your ambition for the future? In your pride? In your insecurity? Your physical wants, desires, emotional wants and desires? Where is he getting to you? But here's the thing, and this is where we can take heart. Satan is lazy. He is, in fact, the master of laziness. He's the prince of laziness. And so he is not going to work hard. He's going to find somebody else if you're going to resist him. And in James chapter 4, verse 7, it says, <coughs> that's supposed to say verse 7. I don't know why it says verse 8. In verse 7, it says, submit yourselves then to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. So the answer is simple. Submit to God. Resist him. Continue to develop that repentant heart. Let it drive you to his word, which you can use as a weapon against his schemes as we saw Jesus do. That's right. Getting back to using that word as a sword, as a weapon to, to resist Satan. And it says, if you resist him, he will flee. He's going to go away. He's going to come back at an opportune time. But if you make it difficult for him, he's going to go away. So how are you going to make it difficult for him? What areas do you know that you're going to struggle with that you can, you can make sure that you're building up your protection? Building up that wall to make sure you, you won't let him in. It's so important for us to think about. And you know what? When we do resist Satan, when we develop this repentant heart and we're very focused on continuing to repent, continuing to weed out sin in our lives from the heart level and letting that produce fruit in our lives. And when we resist Satan, something really amazing happens. Something very powerful. We become confident in who we are and who God wants us to be. Let's take a look at Jesus next here to kind of dem demonstrate this concept. Luke 4, verse 14. So this is after this temptation that Jesus faced. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He was teaching in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. He went to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went to the synagogue, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, the Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery for, of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. He began by saying to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So Jesus having resisted temptation, returns to Galilee, continues his public ministry, goes into his hometown synagogue where everybody knew him, and then using the scripture confidently says, this is who I am. I am here to fulfill this scripture here and now. And this is what happens, isn't it? When we develop that repentant heart, when we resist Satan, we resist those temptations, and we've beaten that, what does that do to us? It creates this unwavering confidence, not in ourselves, but in God and in who God made us to be. So through our confidence in God, we can be confident, confident in ourselves because of him. And so it enables us to confidently go and share who we are, to be who God made us to to be confident in our connection to him. When we're winning the battle, we are more and more confident in who we are in Christ. When we're losing the battle, 
We're overwhelmed. We're insecure. We're afraid. We're, we retreat and we're, we're ashamed. But when we know that we put Satan in his place, we realize that no one can stand in our way with God. We realize that there's nothing that can stop us from doing what God wants us to do. We can shamelessly and excitedly say the words in Romans 8.31 that says, What then shall we say in response to all these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Do you have this kind of confidence in your relationship with God? Do you have this confidence in you because of your relationship with God, Because when you clear out the clutter of sin in your life, when you resist Satan, you no longer are held down by that weight of your sin. You get to be truly you. The you that God made you to be. So a good question to ask maybe is, who are you? Who is it that God has made you to be? It's that version of you that Jesus died for. See, Jesus knew that we were not capable of bearing the weight of our sin. He knew that our sin took us away from who we were meant to be. And so he made it so that you could be you. The you that God sees. The you that has so much potential when you're trusting in him and have allowed him to work through and deal with your sin. To drive you to make the changes that you need to make for him. Again, that's the you that Jesus died for. And as we wrap up, we're going to take communion this morning. To reflect on this. We're going to pass trays that contain the bread and juice that represent Jesus' body and blood. That was sacrificed for us. And we do this to celebrate the sacrifice that allows us to be who we're made to be. That allows us to be truly and authentically ourselves, to remind us to always come back to the foot of the cross, to develop that repentant heart, to fight the battle against Satan, to resist him and his schemes, and to live the lives that God wants us to live. Lives that are full of peace and joy and fulfillment. Lives that make an impact like Christ did. And again, lives that allow us to be truly and authentically ourselves, just as God intended it to be. Let's go ahead with that heart. Pray for the communion and pray for the body and blood of Jesus as we remember who we're made to be. Lord God, thank you so much for giving us this morning. Thank you for the fact that we get to get into your word, to dig in and to see these inspiring examples, Lord, of repentance, of learning to change our hearts, to, to continue to move ourselves to be different, to be better for you, to learn how we can develop that heart and then resist Satan, God. And when we do that successfully, when we're working in tandem with our repentant heart and resisting Satan, we can be, God, who you wanted us to be. We can be truly us. I can be truly me. We can all be truly the people that God wants us to be. Lord, I pray that you continue to help us to see that. Help us to see really who we are. Help us to be motivated to find you, to continue to have that sort of confidence in you, to build that confidence in you if we don't. And see again that that confidence can come from you to us. To be unashamed to share, unashamed, to live the lives that we know that we're supposed to live for you, God. I just pray that you continue to guide us and help us to do this. And thank you so much again for your son, the sacrifice that allowed us to be us, that he was willing to die on a cross, to be able to remove the weight of sin, to be able to remove those things that take us away from you, Lord. And, and instead, because of that sacrifice, we we're able to be with you and connected to you. God, help us to always come to the foot of the cross to remember that. And help us to continue to push change in our own lives, in our own hearts, in our own minds, to be people that are truly giving you the glory that you deserve. God, we love you. We praise you. We pray all of these things in your son's name, Jesus. Amen.